All right. Uh, but before I begin, I want to first thank uh, Sasha and Kara for creating such a fertile uh, soil in the field of typography. Uh, I also want to thank uh, a bunch of people, uh, Carly, Joey, Patrick, uh, for helping me piece this together. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a ton of my documentation for this talk was uh, stolen at a parking lot of an Ikea last summer. Uh, so, you know, it's always good to be in touch with people so they can give you materials. Um, so I, like uh, Sasha said, I, I run a small practice called um, Format XYZ. I am also a full-time lecturer at the University of New Haven, and I teach uh, mostly uh, type and uh, intro classes. Um, and like Sasha said, uh, for my, my act as a facilitator uh, to help people uh, create art, uh, design, uh, and anything in between. Uh, it, you know, the, the name of this uh, talk refers to uh, the film title of a documentary film by a gentleman named Kirby Ferguson titled Everything is a Remix. It also refers to the title of an assignment I give my students and of a 2017 uh, workspace slash exhibition at the University of New Haven, curated by myself and my uh, former partner, Karina Eggmeyer. Uh, the show uh, featured work of typography one students, uh, which were casually accompanied by uh, very historically significant Swiss postage from the private collection of a gentleman named Tom Strong, who will make an appearance. Uh, in a larger sense, however, uh, copy transform combine uh, refers to the much more jargony uh, phrase, uh, process of cultural creation, uh, sans all the political and uh, implications that might want to insert themselves here. And before I continue, I do want to say that uh, 2017 was a much more peaceful year. Uh, Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock hadn't appeared in this skit. Um, and you know, it's given me a bit of an anxiety to talk about um, modernism and Swiss graphic design in the year 2020. Uh, there's a lot of talk about decolonizing design education, and we're all in the process of trying to figure out what that means and how it'll shape. Uh, but what worries me is that I genuinely love modernism. Um, but I was com 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 comforted by a pure mind who mentioned that a lot of these things get uh, become performance once they're professionalized. So I'd urge all the proponents of uh, decolonizing the curriculum to expand the canon rather than to try to limit it and to proceed with the highest degree in honesty uh, and academic rigor. Uh, you know, a few days ago, I was part of this small panel talk hosted by the Hoffman's Milken Center of Typography. Uh, where educators talked about the role of archives in uh, design education. Uh, and one person stood out to me, which was Louise Sandhaus. Uh, she, her brainchild, the People's Design Archive, is a crowdsourced virtual archive built by everyone, about everyone, wherever. I'd urge everybody to check that out. Uh, but never forget that the grid system is always watching you. Uh, the topic of this conversation actually has a very banal beginning. Uh, it started with curiosity, with a curiosity that it comes at 2.30 a.m. Uh, with uh, YouTube rabbit holes. Uh, half asleep but fully awake, I wondered if Joseph Mueller Brockman had passed away in 1996. Had anyone bothered to record him? Uh, what did he, the guy really say? What did he look like? What did he wear? And then I started asking myself, did my undergraduate professors, faithful servants of Cranbrook and deconstruction keep the truth away from me? And this all bothered me because I have to teach uh, typography basics. So I was worried about what kind of lies I was gonna tell the students. Uh, and so on YouTube, you can find the secrets of aquaponics, how to get 30 minute ads, how to make an automated sugar cane on Minecraft. Uh, you can also find the wisdom of a perpetually apoplectic Paul Rand. And you can even hear Muriel Cop Cooper talk about graphic design that was years ahead of her time. But nothing on Joseph Mueller Brockman. Uh, she seemed, uh, it seems like the crown prince of an uh, entire movement was nothing more than an academic, an academic concoction, perhaps a cliche of graphic design. 
I wasn't disappointed, and I'm not sure uh, there is room for disappointment at 2.30 a.m., but I was quite surprised. Uh, however, life always has answers. Sometimes they're hidden on uh, minute 17 of that aquaponics video on YouTube. Uh, but more likely than not, uh, the answers lie in primary and secondary sources, like on the wall of the lobby of the Yale Graphic MFA Studios, uh, where they keep a uh, rotation of uh, original Swiss posters. And, uh, you know, even my friend uh, Aham mentioned that uh, there, there's an old man that comes and switches these posters around, and he pointed at this sign on the wall. Uh, and that man's name is Tom Strong. Uh, he's a longtime resident of New Haven and a graduate of the Yale Graphic Design Program back in the late 60s. Uh, a phone call that afternoon, uh, uh, we had a date for a gallery show, and uh, we also had set up time for students to come visit his collection. Uh, Tom welcomed us in his studio in his house a few blocks away. Students got to ask questions. Uh, they were free to roam around. Um, they asked him anything and everything. And the most awesome thing is that he uh, knows everything about it. He has a personal anecdote for each of the pieces he collects. Uh, and he collects other things. Uh, he has a collection of Swiss uh, fabrics. Uh, train models, stamps, political buttons, uh, and a few other things like drawn collection. Uh, but, you know, even though there's a lot in this collection, not every student is engaged in the same way. Um, the, the, you know, everybody has an opportunity to ask what they want, but in the end, each person has its own, their own history. Uh, you can see a student of mine, uh, Patrick Anderson. Uh, he was acting as a photo photojournalist for the whole experience. And, you know, he eventually, uh, he's, he was doing photography and is doing photography now. So he was able to apply his uh, skills there. Uh, the plan of the exhibition was for students to learn, like in the old times, where students uh, would go to a museum and copy, uh, quote unquote, a masterwork. Uh, but I wanted them to go further. Uh, I wanted them to translate the work, and they had the help of Tom uh, to kind of give more context of each, into each piece. Uh, each student was set to iterate upon the past, adding onto the subject matter their own taste and their own experiences. Uh, I, I had a micro budget and a limited space, so the class uh, voted uh, to uh, post uh, their favorite works on the original wall format size, which is 90.5 by 128 centimeters. Uh, this is a very small gallery that we have, and luckily everything kind of worked out in the end. Um, and, you know, they, they use, they actively use this as a crit space, as a, a workspace. Um, they got close to the work, uh, and I think everybody kind of uh, engaged uh, pretty well. It, it's college, so some of these kids look uh, sleepy, but, you know, uh, we were all there at one point. Uh, but I do want to highlight the work of uh, two students, uh, Joey Nicholas and Carly Greif. Um, the work of Carly uh, focused mostly on uh, form, uh, and she really iterated a lot. Um, and she had a moment here where she like this little bit in the middle, uh, which was kind of like the move that she applied in the end. Uh, and her, she's a very productive uh, person and she kind of inspired everybody to really understand what I meant by uh, iter iterative process. Um, uh, my other student, Joey Nicholas, uh, when he graduated, uh, he went on to uh, start his own tech company uh, but in his own very unique way, uh, where he uh, developed a, his company's brand through very narrative-driven uh, illustration. Uh, and in his sophomore year here, we can see that uh, he gravitated towards his family's past, I think, uh, their musicians. So uh, they all kind of, th that history just showed up in these objects. Uh, this is a leave behind a little wind chime that I believe belonged to his grandmother and that I kept uh, and I had to tell him that I, ha I had it uh, when I asked him for these pictures. Um, and so uh, we, since critiques are kind of uh, uh, the 
final shows are kind of useless. Uh, Tom and uh, Sasha came in and talked about uh, adding more context to uh, what graphic design and Swiss modernism really mean. Uh, I do want to say that I uh, the rest of this talk is uh, will be uh, Tom Strong. I'll give you some of that lived experience that uh, we had with our students, uh, and you can see what I mean by uh, him as a, so a primary source. I do also want to say that I had a butter knife, a 10 minute edit, uh, because he does uh, have a lot to say. So without further ado, here's Tom Strong. Faced with the drafts in 1950, I volunteered and fortunately was sent to first Germany and then Turkey. And in Germany, I learned enough German, which has still proved to be enormously useful as a collector of, of, of Swiss German posters and posters from the 1972 Olympics. I came, back, I came back from that experience, having never been shot at, and decided that I was ill-prepared to do architecture, but that I had a burning interest to do graphic design, which I developed as a special student back in my hometown of Hanover, New Hampshire. And that got me, that resulted in a portfolio that brought me to New Haven that then led to my meeting of my wife and partner to be Marjorie Cohen. And by taking care, we grew slowly. We always answered the phone and tried not to price ourselves uh, uh, out of the market. And thanks to Marjorie, who's no longer with me, no longer alive, it worked out enormously well for me and for her. And today I have her daughter, who's a licensed lawyer and floor, as my full partner. And it's all worked out to enormous advantage. I'm now 81. Don't tell anyone. I will. I'm I'll cut thinking. this out. Uh, so you mentioned uh, you started with uh, Odell Eicher, these Olympic yes. posters. Uh, what else do you collect? Yes. Eicher, I had the good fortune to be at the Olympic site the year after 1973. Most of you will remember that Olympics as the scene of a horrendous murder of Israeli athletes. But lo and behold, at the site, I found the guy who had the residue of posters in the two larger sizes. And out of that, I was able to buy copies of the Olympic posters. Some are on the wall behind me, if you zone up. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the Strong family I was offered posters galore. I could buy them maybe for $10 a piece or less. So that developed a, a long-term interest, never totally satisfied at Otto Eicher's work. And then at Yale, uh, where we, we were, it's hard to, to find the difference, but that we were aware of Swiss design through the magazines, which appeared in the arts and book library right above our classroom here on Chapel Street. And so we would go without any urging from the faculty to inform ourselves. So what are they doing in Switzerland? What are they doing in Germany? What are they doing in Italy? And I found, in general, pictures the size of a cigarette container, but no big ones. And I said, darn it, maybe I can, maybe with any luck, I can find a way to buy the original poster is in their full size, nearly five feet tall by, you know, three feet in width. Chris Pullman was on an expedition uh, trip to uh, Basel and Zurich to meet with Armin Hoffman and the staff in the Mueller Brockman studio. Just incidentally, Chris saw people in 1964 or 67 or, or later cutting up repro to do the typographic posters for Mueller Brockman's uh, Music of Eva series. Both the studio and Armin Hoffman gave Chris Pullman a few extra copies, whatever he desired to bring back. And because Pullman was a friend of some years, he would give me whatever he could spare. And that was as good as rolling up the arm mm -hmm. and finding a vein. And the collection all took off from that initial gift by Chris Pullman, who still teaches at Yale, by the way, having been at GBH Boston for 35 years. There's nothing, because if you look at a poster at this scale, which is about this size in a book, 
you learn something. But if you see it the size of what's behind me, hope, you know, juices start to flow. And you're able to look at it critically in a way that you don't want to do or can't do when it's very small. Yes. I, you know, talking uh, to you uh, when I first met you, uh, you had mentioned um, a few anecdotes that kind of shocked me. And they related to the, the Zeitung uh, Ar Armin Hoffman poster. Yes, and he's here. There you go, that one. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that that was, the image was uh, executed by a student. Yes. Um, it's hard to believe unless you look at the poster full size. He asked the students, who must have felt that they were in purgatory, to translate a coarse half-tone blow-up of the student, the athlete, into a, into a, a, a linoleum block at final size. And they did. So if you look at it closely, you say that's not just an enlarged half tone. That's been cut in a linoleum block to take ink and letterpress printing. The poster was printed in two parts, which is all they could do at the school. which supported the museum in the building above. So th these are the kinds of things that you can notably see when, when you... When, when you... When it's full size. Right now, this poster is in New York City in the Poster House Museum, a brand new museum. Uh, which is closed for now, but will reopen in uh, August. Oh, and some 35 of my posters are there. Yeah, there's something very peculiar about how you collect. Where, where is your collection? Early on, I figured out I can't afford to frame a thousand posters. So probably 600 today are stored in rolls on a wire bookshelf. But my... It wasn't genius because someone else invented Taskbar too. But I found that you could use uh, polyester. Polyester does not shrink. So think of a sandwich. Polyester, larger than the poster. The poster trapped in an envelope of foam core. So the foam core is at the back of the poster and mylar is on the other side. And the mylar is folded around the poster and then taped to the a foam pour. But that allows me, because these posters are all within a fraction of each other in size, that allows me to to pull one out and put another one in. So I have about a, 200 of them wrapped in that fashion. Yeah. But in a matter of minutes, if I run out of empty uh, Mylar hold, poster holders, I can put up a new display. Mm -hmm. And I carry it to this, the graphic design department or I put it up in one of the residential colleges, which has a museum. Yeah. And I'll have to cut it early here, uh, but I, I do want to say that he goes on to say that he does not wish uh, people to collect because it's a very uh, intensive uh, obsession. Um, but uh, to go back to the earlier point, uh, you might ask, what happened to Joseph Miller Brockman? Did you ever find the video? Uh, were you able to solve this mystery? And the answer is, uh, magically, Tom Strong had the answer. Uh, I had run across a dead end where uh, I saw a note on the exhibition catalog of 100 years of graphic design that uh, one such video exists, um, and that was available there at the exhibition, I think, in 2014. Uh, but Kimmy, uh, I think her name is uh, Gimme. Uh, Kimmy, uh, one of the curators mentioned to me that uh, she uh, she couldn't she couldn't give it to me because it belonged to RIT. Uh, I mentioned this to Tom, and he mentioned that uh, Roger Remington of RIT owed him a huge favor. Uh, so CC on an email later, and a few days uh, I got a DVD in the mail, and it was like seeing a father for the first time uh, here. Uh, you can see a two-minute uh, clip of it, and I'm not going to show it to you because I would encourage you to go find these things out for yourself. Uh, in the video, you see Joseph Mueller Brockman, uh, fascinated by the translator here. Uh, he spends the first two minutes of his talk uh, odd at the professionalism about the semiotic uh, symbols that, that this person is uh, 
uh, act, uh, making uh, and, and free and time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it shows us his curiosity. It's not part of um, the script that we know of Joseph Mueller Brockman. We see his curiosity. And so I want to give thanks to the following people for making this possible.